record, please. Nice. James, you should be able to record. Thank you. Okay, I think I will go ahead and call us to order at 7.02. Welcome everyone. Um, I'll ask for commendations first, but if anyone from the public wants to make public comment, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll call on you when it comes time for public comment. Um, any commendations? Megan? Um, I just want to welcome all the teachers back um, and thank you for a great first day on Monday. So welcome everybody. Absolutely. Sarah? I also just want to um, thank everybody for all the extra time they put in this summer. I know that technically the teacher's first day was Monday, but so, so many of them worked out a contract all summer long to collaborate and to get us to where we need to be to, to open our schools. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of that. Absolutely. And you, David? And I would just like to uh, thank um, Cindy Schieffer from the building committee for all the work that she did on the uh, public outreach for the signing of the, of the final steel beam allowing students and parents and citizens to come by and participate in the event and also to uh, Gil Bain for their support, Brian Johnson from left field and everyone that made that happen. But, uh, you know, Cindy did a great job coordinating that. Thanks to her and everybody else for um, a really great day on Tuesday. And um, we might talk about that later, but it, it it's really worthy of recognition. So um, an exciting day on Tuesday for the school project. So. Absolutely. <clears throat> Emily? I just want to second that. It was really an amazing 
week long event. So it was great. Yeah, it absolutely was. It's, um, I think I've said this a few times, but it's, it was nice to focus on something that was not COVID and was very positive and that will see us through into the future. Um, it was a, it was a welcome reprieve. All right. Well, that will take us to public comment. Um, I don't see any hands up currently. Does anybody want to make a public comment? All right, then I will move us forward. Um, uh, Dan Howells is gonna join us at our next meeting. I did touch base with him um, and he is planning on coming back and being our student representative again. And he's going to start, um, I think it's the 17th is our, is our next regularly scheduled meeting. And he'll, he's planning on giving a first day of school update for the remote program. Um, so we'll look forward to welcoming him back at that point. Uh, so that leads us to the consent and action items um, with the minutes. So we have minutes from May to approve. So can I get a motion to approve the minutes from May 7th, 2020, May 21st, 2020, and May 27th, 2020? So moved. Megan moved. Second. David second. Did anybody else have any comments on any of those minutes? Megan? Um, Lisa, there were just a few like typos and um, little omissions that I'll, I can just um, email to you. It's not going to stop me from voting, but more just NFY that will make a few little tweaks. So. On May 21st, the second page, a roll call vote, only the votes were only listed for the first two voting members. The last three were blank. So we'll just need to fill in how people voted as well. Sounds good. And you said that was on the 21st? Middle to second page. Yeah, middle of the second page on May 21st. All right, sounds good. Got that written down. We'll make sure that that gets taken care of. Anything else? All right, so I will do a roll call vote. Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor? Yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes, and I just want to thank Lisa for her work on this. There's been a lot of other things to be focused on, but I appreciate the work that she's done to get these compiled and completed for us. Absolutely. Yep. She thank you, everyone. Up. Yeah, Lisa is a rock star. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. That's sweet of you to say. I feel the same way about you all. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That takes us to our superintendent report. Um, John, I will turn it over to you for a reentry update. We're going to hear, I think, from you about facilities and then Nan from Teaching and Learning. Yes, um, the, I figured it was important and timely to do facilities since we did the MOA uh, that focused on HVAC issues. Uh, Todd provided me an update today uh, that Fuss and O'Neill has been in uh, all week this week, uh, walking through the buildings and they have found no outstanding issues with our ability to circulate air uh, adequately in the buildings. Um, any interior rooms will be uh, outfitted with air purifiers. Uh, they're oversized for those spaces. Any space that is too large will have a second air purifier added to it. Um, one recommendation that Fuss and O'Neill had is to put forth uh, that we should physically inspect the air filters uh, once a month. So Todd will be developing a log, uh, uh, cataloging that work. All the MERV 13 filters are in and are being installed. Um, he has a window and glass company going through, um, inspecting that each window is functional and operational. And if it needs a screen or any parts, um, they will be outfitting those. Uh, Coffin School has received two new oversized roof, uh, rooftop exhaust fans that are running 24 seven. ABS has begun loading the purging program in our system. Um, they're doing some testing at Village School and making adjustments. 
Uh, tomorrow, Todd is replacing four exhaust fan motors at the high school. Uh, there is one to replace at uh, Vets and one to replace at Glover. Um, he has gone through and checked uh, all of the systems. ABS has been in uh, and given their report. And so it does not appear at this time that there would be any HVAC air quality CO2 things that uh, were listed in the MOA uh, that would uh, cause us to uh, not be able to transition on the 14th. Um, continuing to work with the union, and it seems to make good sense to me that we're successfully doing this week with allowing people to be remote or in the building. And again, uh, as I reported in the fireside chat this week, 70% uh, of our educators, and that has gone up uh, each day as new people have come in um, to allow them to continue that choice uh, through the end of next week. So um, I have I've asked Todd to be on standby for phone a friend uh, capacity, but if anybody has any facilities questions, I'm happy to answer them or dish to Todd. John, I, I may have um, missed it. Did you say anything about Eveleth? I did not. There were no okay. issues raised in Todd's report at Eveleth. Okay, perfect. It's really good news that uh, everything seems to be passing and, and we can kind of move ahead with all of this. Yeah, a lot of work done in the past week or two, so. Yeah, I would be remiss not to give Todd a huge shout out. He put in 30 hours last weekend, weekend, Saturday and Sunday, feverishly working to address that. And certainly people pull him aside anytime they see him in the building and say, Todd, can you do this? And he never says no. And so, you know, he's running with some short staffing issues. We've contracted with some outside services but really appreciative of Todd and his crew for all the work that they're doing. Absolutely. Thank you, Todd, and, and to all the custodial staff. Thank you very much. We're getting there. <laughs> so if there are no other facilities, um, I figured that reopening has focused a lot on the big picture and the hybrid or fully remote, that it would be helpful for the committee to hear uh, from Nan Murphy and teaching and learning how some of that big picture stuff is narrowing down to building level work. And so I've asked Nan to update uh, the, uh, the committee. But again, I would be remiss not to give Nan a huge shout out for the work that she has done uh, with teaching and learning, and in particular this week the eight and a half days of professional development that started on Monday. Nan and her team have really put together some rich opportunities. We have internal talent uh, leading professional development. She's done some outside uh, consultants who have been very well received. And so um, professional development's going very well. So a shout out to Nan, and I will turn it over to her to talk about uh, what's happening on the ground at each of the schools. All right, great. Well, thank you, John. Um, I am beyond excited for how this past week has gone, um, welcoming back the teachers and actually getting to see people and get to know folks and put a face to some of the emails I've received. It has been just a continual warm and generous welcome that I have received from Marblehead staff and teachers. And um, this, this week was no different. We started Monday, eight and a half days of professional development. We anchored all of our learning in three specific areas, strengthening and expanding the usage of instructional technology. The second area is ensuring the physical, social, emotional health and wellness of our staff, students and families. And the third area is implementing key initiatives to enhance classroom instruction and student experiences. So this week, um, 
around the social and emotional um, physical health. We had Todd and Deanna McCann speaking to us at our opening day about all of the work that's been completed over the course of the summer and the proper physical care that we need to take of ourselves, our masks, our classroom spaces, our workspaces, um, bathrooms, uh, school, open areas. So we spent about two hours learning and becoming very familiar with the resources that are available to us in district through um, that maybe haven't been here in the past, large buckets of cleaning supplies and where that is all located. Um, the along the lines of a social emotional wellness, we had a consultant come in and talk to our K and two through two teachers about building classroom community remotely and in person because we have heard over and over from families and teachers that they understand the value of that relationship and we wanted to put some more tools in the toolbox. And so that provider will come back tomorrow and professionally develop our third through sixth grade staff with those systems and structures for community building. Um, all of the principals um, took John and I up on an invitation to attend some PD over the summer with a small team of teacher leaders and to come back with the intention of presenting what they've learned to their staff. And so that this week they did some professional development internally on engaging students and learners. And I attended a number of um, different schools in that PD and it was outstanding. The, the principals and their teams did an outstanding job putting that PD together. Um, we introduced a new platform uh, in terms of technology to our K through second grade teachers, the Seesaw. It is a warehouse, um, it, it, it works a lot like Google Classroom, but it's much de more developmentally appropriate. And so we had some PD around that. Teachers were given PD around all the different variables within Zoom and being able to do breakout sessions so that they can do uh, some small group instruction with students in small breakout rooms. We, um, today I attended another phenomenal PD, which I was glad was recorded because I couldn't take my notes fast enough on Screencastify, something that I have not used yet. Uh, so that's another, uh, really important instructional tool that I think uh, was really well received for, from our Marblehead staff. And again, um, it was differentiated. We had our elementary teachers together and then we will have our middle school team together for PD as well. We had internal Google Classroom users and various levels of expertise offer professional development differentiated. There were, a, there were beginner sessions, intermediate sessions and advanced sessions for our teachers. So it didn't matter what level you were, we were able to push you in your learning and your thinking and being able to um, bring new things to kids this year. Uh, and in terms of instructional support, we're not just about PD in the Office of Teaching and Learning. We are doing a lot of other great things. We, John and I welcomed 12 new teachers to the district at our te new teacher orientation last week. Um, our, our collaborative teacher leader in that role is Sally Chevry, who put on an amazing welcoming presentation. She's aligning all of our new teachers with professional staff as to serve as mentors. She'll be running that program with me, meeting with staff regularly, making sure that they have everything they need to be successful as first year teachers. Um, we are also brought to the district Ames Web Plus. Ames Web has been an assessment tool in the district in the early elementary grades. We expanded it to now serve our K through eighth grade students. So I'm working with Rebecca Brand and she's professionally developing all teachers in that grade span on how to implement the assessments look at the reports they generate and be able to use that data purposefully to plan and change instruction for the very next day and also 
move intervention model instruction forward and using paras and tutors um, with that data. So that's exciting. Um, I, I will be meeting next week with all of our cohort C teachers. Those are our teachers that are going to be in full remote teaching. So we will be working together to calibrate our expectations for students, talking about building relationships with kids, talking about communicating with families, and most importantly, talking about how do you stay connected with your in-school staff and colleagues so that you're all pacing and aligning instruction the same way. So students are getting what they need, whether they're regardless of the model that they're being instructed in. And I'm working with Michelle Cresta on really aligning our, our purchases in terms of um, instruction. So looking at updating some curricular materials, looking at um, what kinds of materials we currently have and where and how are they servicing students. And if there's a better way to serve students, we're, we're looking to discontinue contracts and bring aboard more relevant and current track um, contracts. Ex um, I'll end with something that I think is gonna make parents happy. We have implemented uh, bringing Clever on board and that is our new hub of logins and it centralizes all of the emails that parents over the summer I've been learning have really struggled with in the spring. So there'll be one place for kids to go. They'll be, it'll be very systematic and routine how they access their daily ag um, agendas and their Zoom links, so their Google Classroom links, and um, hopefully help organize the household a little bit. So those are just some of the things that are happening. I welcome anybody, parents, teachers to reach out, send an email. I've had a, had a great opportunity to have people come into my office and meet with me. I would extend that opportunity to anybody in the district. So um, having a, we're looking forward to a great um, next week, looking forward to even some more professional fun. So if anybody has any questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, and this is all so exciting to hear. Um, you know, there's so many little buzzwords and, and, you know, sort of topics that have been inflammatory or incendiary, incendiary. like it, it's just, it's great to hear that you're on top of all of these things and that our staff are, are learning more and, you know, the piece with Google Classroom of, or that you're able to really bring people in at whatever level that they're at, that was great. Um, and it's, it's all really exciting to hear. Great. Go ahead, Meg. Um, so similar to facilities, man, I am just like amazed at the amount of work that has happened in the past week since we've spoken to you. Um, it's really impressive. Um, I know personally as a parent, I am really thankful for Clever uh, and looking forward to, to using that. So thank you. Um, and I just wanted to say that also what struck me in your update is the use of our internal expertise and making sure that we're kind of sharing the knowledge across the board. So I think that's just a great, great approach. So um, no questions at this point, you know, I've been in to talk to you already, but um, I just think that that's a really, you know, we've got such an amazing resource in all our staff. So I'm really glad to see that we're kind of sharing, sharing the wealth there. Yeah. We had 20 teacher leaders leading professional development this year, this, this past week. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, man, or Nan, I, I love the train the trainer model. Do you foresee utilizing that for more professional development um, throughout, you know, this year in particular, but, but um, definitely, you know, in the, the next few months? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially once we really get to some really uh, exciting lessons that have been developed, you know, looking, looking internally for teachers to share really good lessons and structures and tools that they've found and located or developed themselves. So absolutely. And any of these um, PDs like train the trainer that you're using, the vast majority are only good. They're good for the, the faculty, I understand, but some might be good um, to put on the parent website too, you know, on, on how to utilize your Google Classroom and things. Yeah. I know a lot of parents need that, that extra bit of tech help. Yeah, myself definitely included. 
And we've started talking about that. John and I have talked about how do we get those videos out and accessed for, for parents to access. So we're definitely thinking about it and we'll be creating those and probably using our teacher leaders to do it. <laughs> so. Perfect, thank you, Nan. Yep. Emily or David, any questions? No, I, I don't have any questions. It just seems like Nan's been here for years. She's just jumped in and is, um, you know, moving things forward. So thanks, Nan. That, there was a lot there in, in your update. And I've heard from, uh, from John and Sarah and others as well. So yeah, really, really great to hear. And, and thanks for um, moving us in the right direction as we look to open our schools. Yeah, I don't have any questions. I spoke with Nan the other day. I popped my head in and she was able to answer them, which was great. So thank you for always being there yeah. to answer our questions. You got it. I, I really think that it was so wise to start things off with um, talking with Todd and Deanna too. I think, you know, there's so much anxiety around and, and you know, whether it's Marblehead or a private school or any other district, there's so much anxiety around the nuts and bolts of facilities and how we keep each other well that, you know, I think it's just, it, it's so beneficial to be able to, to have access to those people who are coordinating all of that for the district. Agreed. All right, anything else from anybody? All right, well, thank you, Nan. Got it. Thanks, John, um, for those updates. And with that moves us on to the Northeastern Conference Fall Sports One conversation. Um, sure, so, before ahead, I jump John. into the athletics piece, I just want to uh, dovetail on something that Sarah Fox said about staff uh, giving of their time this summer and uh, Sarah Gold, your comment about starting with the health and safety stuff. Deanna McMahon as our nurse leader has been exceptional and she may be the only one in the district that answers email faster than I do. And there is not a parent or a community member or a staff member or an administrator that poses a question. And you can imagine at this time, the number of questions about mask and hand washing and social distancing and contact tracing, and Deanna is right on top of it and responds immediately. So I think that uh, she certainly deserves the shout out for that. Absolutely. Um, in terms of NEC, I will give a, a brief uh, introduction and then uh, turn it over to high school principal and the athletic director. Um, as with everything COVID, the best decisions are made in the moment and then the conditions on the ground change and new decisions have to be made. And so when the NEC uh, decided uh, 803 uh, that they would postpone to fall two, that made sense at the time. Um, last Friday, the NEC superintendents got together, had further conversation because things were changing as a community went from red to yellow or yellow to green. And so we ask uh, the athletic directors and the principals to revisit that decision as we were hearing from our school committees that they felt perhaps not part of that process and would like to be more included in at least the backstory of how we got there. And so I've asked uh, Dan and Greg to talk about that backstory today with the understanding that I believe the athletic directors met today and the principals at the direction of the superintendents are scheduling a meeting where we can revisit the decision to maybe not postpone fall to fall two. So I don't want to steal Dan or Greg's thunder, but they're going to provide you a little backstory. And I would, even though I'm told I don't need to, uh, apologize that school committee was not looped in to this, but I think uh, the superintendents when we met last Friday each recognized that um, school committee needed to be more a part of this uh, decision. So I will acknowledge that and turn it over to Mr. Bauer. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Um, just to give some background, as we know, on August 18th, the MIA in collaboration with DESE um, made recommendations and guidelines for athletics for this year. 
within that, there's two main points. Number one, there's a creation of a flex season. So in essence, they created four seasons. The flex season was is located right after that winter season between wedge between winter and spring to allow if there's any situations that um, don't allow a, a, a district to play or participate in fall athletics, they could move that to that particular point or if, a, if the community was in red, same thing. Also, the second key point is the ability to have out of season practices. So it's in essence, rule 40 was waived, which um, I have to admit I was against at first because as a coach and, and knowing that um, there's a lot of demands on our student athletes. Um, but at the end of the day, maybe that might've been a game changer too in terms of how this decision process was going because that would allow what we all miss for those meaningful connections with our coaches and with our teams and such. So the principles we met on, well, actually the athletic directors met before us, they discussed a number of issues in terms of what it would look like moving into a fall one season, uh, particularly with a lot of the complications with, with a lot of our league schools at that time, uh, going through tough situations and just the overall piece of how would we logistically launch, launch a fall season at this time. Uh, we followed the meeting and basically how it works is they make recommendations, it moves to the principals. Um, and we sat and discussed, you know, it was a joint meeting of the athletic directors and principals. And we discussed the outcome of their meeting along with discussions from each of the NEC schools in terms of their feelings and thoughts and where we're going with this. Um, and in all honesty, there were a number of things and factors that were discussed. And I think one of the big pieces at the time, there are five districts, five schools out of the 12 that were in the red category, which means they're not uh, eligible to play in the fall season. They have to automatically move to the flex season. Number two, there are five more schools that are starting remote. And with that piece, that means school committee approvals necessary in order to play in that fall one season. So at that point, that's 10 schools, five for sure couldn't play. The other five that really not sure where that would go. The two schools that were in the hybrid just need you know superintendent approval to move forward. So that that's problematic for a number of reasons because that creates a lot of uncertainty in terms of where that would be, what kind of what kind of season would be, where those teams are. If a number of them move the fall to, a few are left behind. Also, the new guidelines indicate that um, if you're trying to find an opponent to fill schedules, you can't go outside of your geographic region. They really want you to stay close for obvious reasons and, and try to stay within your league. Those are some main pieces there too. The other part is, is that, you know, the thoughts of like, what happens if the season starts, it stops? Will students lose those meaningful opportunities because, you know, what, maybe they could have had a meaningful season in that, that fall to that flex season, coupled with a, a rich, a fall of practices and structured um, opportunities to meet with coaches. The second piece, quite frankly, is the fact of trying to start school safely, putting our attention on bringing our students back in, our faculty back into the building, following the guidelines and making sure everybody's safe. On top of that, making sure that is there enough time to really implement the guidelines that we need it to be for safe schools, for safe athletics. Major concern to a transportation because as we know transportation, quite frankly, is cut in half for bus capacity. We already struggle with transportation. Marble is known for being difficult to get here, but it's also difficult for us to get out too. And will that put extra pressure on us to look at how that would work for transportation in, in terms of will that increase liabilities, in terms of does that limit opportunities for sub varsity participation because of just transportational needs? You know, it, so those items were floating around also to you know, certainly knowing that the other piece is working together as a league is, is important because, you know, we, we know they're tough decisions and we took the information that was at that time, the best information that we had to try to make a decision that would best fit the needs of individual communities as well as the league to work together for a number of those factors. And certainly the piece that kept running through my mind is the fact that our students are missing content contact and connections. Totally, totally get it. We need to be able to provide opportunities. Greg and his subcommittee have done awesome work in trying to create structures for our student athletes, but also all of our students and whatever extracurriculars we can come back to because we can't forget the other students as well. I know I'm getting off track. Um, so we, we're looking at, can we provide again, 
the great practice opportunities and then knowing and obviously you know knowing that the the fall two season begins february 22nd through april 25th i know you can't get on the golf course on february 20th i know that i know you're not going to be on the cross country trails on february 22nd but can you couple the fall experience with great practices and then change your com competition period in that fall too to match almost as many competitions if you work it the right way Obviously, weather is always a factor in the spring, and we know that. Um, and, and certainly, New England is a challenge as it is, as well as facilities, as well as making sure, that, again, we work together. And certainly, knowing that we have, I think, one of the best trainers around, knowing the fact that one trainer for typically, we're very well known for our participation, being able to make sure that all those guidelines are in place for safety for all the sports, all the coaches. And everybody, that, that just really certainly has kept me up at night, but maybe that's because I'm old and that's what happens. Um, because I, as anybody else, value extracurriculars. That's the strength of our school, strength of our community. So these decisions aren't easy. And certainly, you know, as we went around the table, you know, everything was, was dubbed out and, and, and it wasn't about taking away an opportunity. It's about being able to preserve as best as we can an opportunity to, to allow participation that flex too with fall interactions as best we can. Um, so we went, we took the vote, uh, it was 903. And then really what happens now, it's a recommendation that moves, moves up, moves along. Um, and that's where we're at at this point. So, you know, the other piece too of indicators to think about, and I know this is keeping Greg up at night, is that the sports medicine committee came out with sport specific recommendations uh, in terms of modifications of rules that certainly um, will change some of the dynamics of games. And, and I don't have all that memorized yet, but I know the game of soccer will be very different and certainly field hockey, but more importantly, safety guidelines, including measuring temperature for every athlete that comes in for practice and for games and monitoring that, as well as also monitoring attendance very closely. Then obviously, you know, if there's transportation, the seating charts within the bus, as we'd have seating charts in our classroom too. So um, obviously we, we're talking as a, as a league of principals and we have a, another meeting tentatively scheduled for early next week. Somebody wanted to have it on Monday. We're all like in this world of getting started and somebody said that's Labor Day. So we can't meet on Labor Day. So I would have, but anyway. Um, but I believe it, it may be Tuesday or Wednesday, they're trying to find a date to have a meeting to reconvene the principals. And I know the athletic directors met today. I frankly haven't had a lot of time to catch up with Greg. I see him right there. Nice to see you, Greg. Um, and that really is the, the crux of the discussion points with the principals uh, working with the athletic directors and trying to, to work together as a league. Thanks, Dan. Um, Greg, before I open it up for any kind of questions, can do you have, um, Dan just mentioned the sports medicine stuff. Do you have any information that you can share on on different recommendations that are being made? I'm assuming it's to it's to kind of keep students say, as safe as possible. Yeah, so just a few of the key points that are kind of overarching points. Uh, this is for every sport, not sport specific. Um, like Dan mentioned, you have to have your temperature taken and have a check checklist filled out before every single practice or every single game every day for every kid. Uh, which is very time consuming and um, requires a lot of staff or a lot of time from one staff member. Um, there's no locker room usage anyway, but that's just one of our rules, but uh, any, any bag or athletic bag that a, a student athlete brings in has to be disinfected before and every before and after every practice or every game. Um, they can't keep them in lockers they have to be six feet apart from any other kid's bag. Uh, let's see. There are face coverings have to be worn at pretty much every single event during pretty much every single time. Uh, that goes for coaches and officials as well, not necessarily just our, our own kids. Uh, we have... Sports specific wise, like Dan mentioned, there's some dramatic changes in, in soccer and, and uh, field hockey. Soccer is not really even soccer anymore. There's, there's, it's, it's so different. It's, it's, 
it's not going to be the same thing. Uh, if you want, do you want to get into specifics at all? I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think, oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, but I, I am, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of on the the mask path, so I'm glad to hear that that masks are being looked at and utilized. Um, Dan, did you want to add something? I, I was just going to ask Greg too. I know that there was recommendations in terms of fans and, and spectators too through there, but um, I haven't caught up with Greg on that because that's certainly a big factor as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they've kind of left that up to individual leagues to decide upon. Um, obviously, if fans are going to be coming to the games, they have to be socially distanced. They're supposed to be wearing their masks at, at every game. But again, that's going to require someone to make sure that they're actually following those guidelines. Um, and again, if, if it's going to be by league, you know, it has to be kind of a league wide decision or it's going to be, you know, different at Danvers versus Beverly versus Swampscott versus us. And that can be uh, create a challenge as well for us. One, um, one of the things that was really impactful in our meeting that you brought up. Greg was when you talked about the guideline that you have to disinfect each individual ball between every single play. Um, yeah. So, so for example, for, for soccer, they broke instead of just two halves, they've broken into four quarters uh, and you have to have a new, a new and disinfected ball every quarter for volleyball, which is uh, very dramatic after every single rally, you have to have a new ball put in play, um, which if uh, I see, you know, Coach Claire Miller's on here. She would probably go crazy by that because it's, it's it's it could be a serve and it could be an ace, and you have to put a new ball in, or it could be just a serve and return that a new ball has to go in. It's it's, it's very different. It, you can't be within, I believe, it's three feet of the net, which is really not even volleyball anymore. You can't really block. You can't spike. It's it's a whole different game. It's it's very dramatic difference in some of these sports. Greg, one more thing too, just sure. um, just more communication in terms of what's happening um, at the leagues uh, around the Commonwealth. Uh, they're starting to look at is is a situation where volleyball may move to the fall too, because it's indoor sport anyway, and would that allow you know um, fewer athletes during that time to focus in and looking at uh, other opportunities to move sports if necessary. Yep. And, and just while we're on that, there are three other leagues who have also decided to move their entire seasons to the fall too. Uh, and other leagues are also discussing it as well at, you know, as we go. It, 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 again, it changes every hour, as you guys have seen with everything coming back to school wise, not just athletics. Greg, just a, just a clarification. Um, the points that you just talked about with the sports medicine and temperatures, et cetera, is that what came out of your athletic director's meeting today? Or is no. there any other updates from that meeting? No, that meeting today actually didn't really bode much information. A lot of a lot of schools are in a similar situation that we're in right now, kind of waiting on guidance from school committee. And you know, we gave our recommendation to the principals after our principal and AD meeting, and we're just kind of waiting for a, a final decision. Uh, we thought we kind of had one last week with the 903 vote, and then it kind of came back to us, and now we're we're here and where we are tonight. I will say in our, our um, athletic opening committee, Greg and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, the perception I've gotten is from this, the coaches on this um, on that subcommittee that they were in alignment with the recommendation and decision that was by the AD. Is, so the, the survey that we sent out to, to coaches was more so for this actual upcoming fall season. Oh, no, not, not the survey, but the coaches on our committee um, were, were supportive of what the ADs decided. Correct, yes. Do these modifications, are, are these just for this fall or is it for the whole year? So right now, this is for just the fall because okay. teams that are actually participating this fall throughout the whole state are going to be following these guidelines. Okay. They're going to so, be meeting, I believe it's October 29th, is there is their next time they're going to be looking at the winter uh modifications for all the other winters. Okay, so it's by season that they'll make? Correct, yeah. Okay. Greg, was there any talk um, in that sports medicine piece about any of the pieces coming back, especially the, as the Big Ten and some of the, um, the other uh, college leagues are looking at the cardiovascular effects on student athletes who have tested positive for COVID and how com competition could be harmful to, to them? Truthfully, no, that, that hasn't really been brought up, at least not at, at our level quite yet. There is that whole, like, it's a COVID-19 task force at the MIAA. 
and they are kind of the ones who present things to the board of directors who then gets voted on and then kind of passed down to us. Um, but there, there really hasn't been a lot of that information given to us uh, to answer your question. Okay, thanks. I think it's really important for the school committee to understand as well that um, Greg has presented in to the, the reopening athletic and activities committee options to still keep kids active in, at an intramural level. Um, and actually it will be opened to children or to students who might not have, have played at a competitive level. It will be open to everyone is my understanding. So there, there will still be these social, emotional and athletic opportunities. It just will, will stay within our, um, our school versus, you know. Megan? In, in, that, in that scenario though, are we still required to, um, implement those same recommendations that you just walked through, Greg? So if we're gonna be just within our own district, yep. some of these rules are a little bit more relaxed. This is this is more for when we're we're going against other schools and having, you know, inter-school competition. If we're doing more of an intramural piece, there are there are EEA guidelines that are out as well that is, is more so geared towards um, like adult leagues or youth sports that are out there and they're not quite as stringent as these ones. So for example, like the temperature taking and the, and the locker room, are those some of the, the things? That I don't think the locker room is going to be used anyway, just because that's indoors. I don't think we're going to have any our kids okay. go inside anyway, okay. but the temperature taking piece, I don't, I don't believe that's part of it. Okay. Um, it'd be just like we were having a practice for, for uh, okay. an out of season, out of season team right now. Okay. David. So I, I, I saw in the Salem news and on Twitter is, is it a fact that mask and omen is going forward with athletics? Yes. That's yeah. So they had their school committee meeting last night uh, and, and they, they voted on uh, having Masco play in the fall one season or your, or kind of a, your regular fall season. So who will they be playing if nobody else is participating? I think that's kind of the major issue right now is they would be uh, currently alone. Um, like I mentioned before, I, I know that some schools are kind of waiting uh, conversations like we're having right now to see what's going on. Um, yeah. John? Um, well, I'll... Sorry. David, I mean... John just wanted to add something, David. Hold on a second. Okay. Go ahead, John. No, I think that that's a beautiful segue into, I wanted the school committee to have the opportunity to hear the backstory. The superintendents, when we met, wanted uh, to see if there is a path forward beginning October 2nd for us to consider the fall season of play. And so I think Masconomic was the first to jump out there. And so this evening, if the school committee would like us to explore a path forward having fall sports in the fall season beginning on October 2nd. For Marblehead, that accomplishes two things. First, because our hybrid model begins on October 5th, it does not require a vote of the school committee because we are in remote. If you are in remote learning, Desi is asking that it is a vote of your school committee uh, to approve uh, interscholastic athletics. Um, and it also gives us the opportunity to have uh, a couple weeks of school to address some of the concerns that Mr. Bauer raised, uh, that the principals were concerned about getting school up and running safely. Um, so I think that th that is the decision before the committee this evening is, would you like uh, to join the NEC? And I can anticipate uh, from the conversation last Friday that superintendents would like the principals and the athletic directors to explore the feasibility of at least offering some fall sports uh, beginning on October 2nd. Can I just clarify on that, John, though? If it starts on October 2nd, um, how does that affect the overall season? Is it, do they still have the same number of competitions? Is it still a full you, season? You must have heard my conversation with Mr. Bauer this morning. I asked yeah. that uh, exact question. I think that it will uh, condense a season and certainly MIA is not doing any tournament play, uh, but we would have yeah. to see who 
is moving forward with the fall season, like if it's just Masconomet and Marblehead, which I do not anticipate that being the case based on the superintendent's conversation, um, how many are going to do that and what would a schedule look like within the league? Okay. Megan, November 20th would be the last day of the fall okay. season. Okay, thanks. And sorry, sorry, David, I'm sorry if I'm jumping over you, but just one more clarification. Because when you mentioned, Dan, that there were five, you said five of the 12 were red, five others were, were remote. We were considered remote at that point because we, even though we're moving yeah. into a hybrid. Okay, okay, sorry. David, no, you kind of jumped on. Sorry, and, David. No, it's fine. Do you have any other questions? Emily. No, I, I just want I just want to thank I just want to thank Dan and Greg. I mean, <laughs> what can we say, right, Dan? We we all we all know, you know, you're you're down at Seaside at baseball games and field hockey games. You're at football games. You're you're the principal of the high school. You're as much as uh, as a sport promoter as anyone. Greg is our athletic director. Clearly, that's what his his um, job is, and, and I know I know it's difficult what you're going through, and I know that you're putting the safety of our students um, for, first and foremost. That we need to get back to school, then we need to figure out how can we do athletics, and and I and I really appreciate that, and I just want to say that I hope there's an opportunity, whether it is, you know, if field hockey gets modified to seven on seven and um, soccer has no throw-ins and their kick-ins and if there's things that can be done so that, um, you know, thinking back, you know, some of us who've had students that have gone through the school, if it was their senior year and how can they safely participate to have some sort of, um, you know, academic season? And, and we know that how much academics adds to the overall uh, development of a student from being on a team and uh, participating and winning and losing and all those all those benefits. So I, I appreciate it, Dan and Greg. I, I know you're focused on that as a priority, and I'm hopeful that the NEC might be able to find an opportunity, even if we have to play Swamp Scott three times in a week. Uh, maybe there's an opportunity, to, you know, to have three soccer games in a week and it's all versus Swamp Scott, um, that we might we might be able to do that and um, for seniors and other, and other students to participate in athletics. So thanks for what you're doing. I appreciate that you're um, continuing to um, move forward and, and look at the uh, situation changes. Thank you. Emily? Um, so mine kind of feeds off of what David just said and I was wondering if there's been any talk about um, student athletes who are going for scholarships for college and how I know they have to have videotapes and, and obviously recruiters won't be coming probably, but has there been talk about how they can get that um, field time or any gymnastics time like how are they going to get that to go um on their resumes or applications or what if they're getting scholarships or anything like that just has that has that been brought up yeah i, I think that was kind of the reasoning behind that that flex season that they moved so that that still gives kids an opportunity even if they're in kind of those red towns that still gives them an opportunity to you know hope that things clear up uh or at least get better and gives them an opportunity to actually play and, sh and showcase those talents. And certainly during the practice opportunities, I know it's not the same as competition, but sometimes you could even create a combine situation or something where you can measure skills um, in that, because really it's a, it's a situation around the country and, and recruiters, you know, it's a real challenge for them to get the film and that to evaluate too. It's tough. It's come up at a few meetings, though. For instance, Annie Madden brought up, she's the girls lacrosse coach, um, you know, wanting to find ways to work with those students that are, are headed to the next level of pet play. Um, so it's definitely being discussed in our committee, I think. So I've got one more question. 
it was helpful to me when I was reading the guidance to understand that when the town is in red, they cannot compete. Um, so that it we're not we're not having to make those types of choices um, on who is sort of how we're who we're allowing to compete and not allowing to compete. If a town, so you know, we in Marblehead are are doing well. If at some point we start not doing well and we've decided to push this forward and then we go red, how does that impact sort of the season and the the schedule and, and you know because or any town that, that that happens to? Greg can answer that. He actually has some uh, got information today on that. Yeah. So if if we let's say we start our our soccer season on September 18th and we you know we start practicing and we have you know a scrimmage in a game or two and then something happens where we we go to red and we can't play anymore we are we're done and we're shut down for the remainder of the season and we'll be pushed into the fall 2 season the only so thing that we don't quite have yet is in terms of like and this isn't clear like how far does that go into that yeah season so Does that mean, the, like, yeah there, there isn't like a there isn't a set date where like say you play half your season and if you go red you're done there there really isn't that number out there yet i know it's in discussion right now um but there would be an opportunity to move to that fall two season so long as you know you're not playing 16 of your 18 games type thing you probably wouldn't be approved because if if you do go into the red uh, and you want to play in that next fall two season, you do have to officially apply to the, to the DAC, the, the district athletic committee. So when, there was a process. Sarah. Greg, you, you, you had another meeting today with the ADs. Um, did, was there any change in the recommendation that came out of that meeting from what was previously recommended? from the uh, athletic directors? Like, was the recommendation of your conference athletic directors still to hold off to fall two? Or did you guys reverse that vote? It, nothing changed. The only thing that thing changed was, was Masco. They were one of those nine. So I guess technically now it's eight, one, three. I, I, to, be, to be honest with you, I don't know even if the school committee voted for, for them to play. I don't know if that means that they would still vote to play by themselves because they would have a really hard time finding opponents because no one else in our league would be playing. And you're not really supposed to go out very far outside of the league, just, just to basically surrounding towns. So I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I think you're, you and Dan probably have more to say about any of this. Um, you know, hearing my, my getting to hear from Will and other people on our, our subcommittee has been helpful too, but since you two are the ones that are here speaking to us, is it your recommendation given the, guidelines that you'd have to meet you know the the all the different pieces i'm sorry that you would still recommend waiting to fall through well i think at the end of the day i mean that is a tough question uh, on this piece because you know out of fairness you know not to not to cop out of the question but out of fairness to the league and to everybody else you know that's i think the main purpose that you know john said was for us to come back and, and talk about it as a group and see if you know we could certainly make any modifications to the initial recommendation because we'll come back with the recommendation I'm sure uh, if that one is modified and changed so um, certainly um, I'm not going to go alone on that decision without Greg and our people in terms of what we need to do because at the end of the day it has to be a very well thought out decision and things change so quickly uh, because tomorrow maybe those other red are, are no longer red and who knows so um, that's as best as I can give you an answer on that one right Absolute, now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've got two questions right now. So if we if we vote to move this forward and, and move ahead with the fall one season tonight, it's not it's not it isn't necessarily a done deal. No. And then one question pertaining to budget, given the transportation pieces what what type of budget implications does that have and would that need to impact something like student user fees uh, or the student activity fees um, in order to cover the possibility of additional busing needs? I think that's a safe assumption. I think if we were to move forward with fall in fall and we 
were traveling and could take half the number of students on a bus and would have to take two buses or three buses, that would certainly have implications that then we would need to look at uh, user fees uh, as a means to compensate or accommodate that. I think the question before the committee tonight before uh, you is you're not gonna make a binding decision. The vote for this evening, if you were to vote, is to ask uh, Dan and Greg to go back to the NEC to see if there is a viable path to start on October 2nd and have some modified fall sports. And so that would really be, you're not voting to play fall sports. Uh, you're not voting to commit to playing fall sports. You're just asking them uh, to go back and uh, re-engage the conversation that if uh, the league were to look at September, October 2nd as a start date, is there a viable path forward for some of our fall sports, whether that's cross country, golf, field hockey, modified soccer? Do we need a vote to do that? Are they not? They're doing that already. It sounds like Dan set up a meeting for next week, and and Greg is in talks now. Do they do they need our vote for that? I, I think it's more symbolic, Sarah, than anything. Well, so I I'll go ahead and ask for a motion to ask Greg and Dan to continue to talk with the NEC principals and athletic directors to see if there's a pathway forward to a modified fall one sports participation. So moved. Megan moved. Second. David second. Can we add the date in of October 2nd? I think that would be helpful. Okay. so. Sorry. Can we so we'll amend that um, amend that motion to October second start date with an October, October so with October an October second start date of the season. So just for clarification, this is different than what Masconomic voted on. They voted that they were were committing to fall sports. We're not voting for that. We're just requesting they go back and, and have a discussion, correct? I believe that is this motion that Sarah has made or the motion that she's put forward. So I think I need I think I need a second on the amendment. Second? You you Oh, I can't make the amendment. Sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll second. I'll second. Okay. So, all right, so I'll roll call the amendment first. Well, so, do you have what was the amendment? To add um, October 2nd okay. as the start date. So, Sarah Gold, yes, this is for the amendment. Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor. Sorry, are we voting on it now or are we having a discussion? This is just for the amendment. Okay, yes. Emily Barron. Yes. Sarah Fox. Confused. Yes, we're just allowing this to just be, yeah. for the October 2nd, yes. David Harris. Yes. Okay, so we have an amended motion to include October 2nd. Is there any other questions or comments on the motion in general? Um, can I just say something? I kind of want to echo what David said earlier that, you know, Dan and Greg, we appreciate the work you've done here. I trust your judgment and I know that you have the best interests of our students and our athletes and our community at heart. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate you, you know, taking us back and having that conversation. So thank you. Yeah, I, I feel very similarly. I think, you know, as I think John stated at the very beginning of this conversation that, you know, we've continued to look at a lot of different things throughout this situation and how it impacts our students and our planning. And so I think I view this motion as just support for you guys to continue to, to look at the data and talk with your colleagues. And you know you have my full confidence that you guys will be able to make a decision that is at, in the best interest of our student athletes as well as our, our full student body. Because I think that's the, the larger concern is that something that we do with sports could impact the ability to actually be in person at school. All right, anything else? 
I just I just want to um, chime in that I've been incredibly impressed with how collaboratively these meetings have been run and um, you know Greg organizes them obviously but everything is a team um, no pun intended because this is for athletics everything has been a team approach um, and I'm, I've been really impressed so I I personally have no concerns whatsoever that that Greg and Dan aren't you know, gonna gonna get those kids in the field at the earliest moment they can safely. Um, so I, I support everything they're doing. Thank you. David, do you have anything last you wanna say? No, just I'm disappointed that the Quakers won't be playing the big green this fall and I won't be able to have a little side, a little side action with Dan. <laughs> We'll have to pass this season um, on that, but um, you know, absolutely, Dan. I mean, to you and the coaches, everybody wants to be on the field. And um, if parents need to drive the students to games like they do with youth sports, and they'll do that. If there's something that we need, I'm I'm sure we'll we'll figure it out, and hopefully. Um, there's a happy medium where kids will get to have some sort of competition this fall. So thanks for all you're doing. All right, so I will call for a vote. Uh, Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor? Yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. All right, so thank you both Dan and Greg for that update and for the conversation yeah. around that. It's really appreciated to better understand all everything that's going on with this issue. All right, that moves us along to the uh, veteran school nurse appointment. Uh, John, do you wanna, do you have anything to add with that? Um, no, I just want to thank uh, Emily Barron for serving as the school committee rep on the search, and we have uh, put forward Andrea Wagoski as the veterans nurse, and as a matter of uh, policy or practice, the school committee needs to vote to approve her uh, as the new school nurse. You have her application or her resume uh, in the packet for your reference. Does anybody have any questions before we move to accept that? Um, I have a question about our nursing staff, but not, not on this hire. Would this be the right time to ask it? I suppose so. Um, just looking at her resume, I, I noticed she's got um, hospital experience, which is great. And it made me think, um, are any of our current nurses that are in our schools working per diem in hospitals at the same time? And does that, are there any concerns that we may have about, you know, the potential of increasing cont contamination issues if they're working in, you know, an emergency setting or a ICU setting as, at, in a per diem basis? I can't answer that tonight, but I'll certainly work to get an answer for you on that side. And I don't think we can control that. It's just a question if it's happening, you know, if it's happening. Certainly. So I will ask for a motion to approve the hire of, I apologize, I, my, it's not coming up on my computer. Can you remind me of her name? Andrea Wagoski. To approve the hire of Andrea Wagoski as the veteran school nurse. So moved. Megan moved. Second. Emily second. Any other Can I just say comments? one quick thing? Mm -hmm. um, so Andrea was my top choice and I thought she was great. Um, she had a wonderful interview and she was young and enthusiastic and willing to learn. And I think she will make a great addition to the school and cause she's kept talking about working with everybody in the school and being um, a team player. Um, so. It's a really great choice. That one. Great. Yeah. Thanks for that. All right. Uh, I'll roll call. Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor? Yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. David Harris? Yes. All right. Great. That 
passes five to zero. And that leads us to the approval of the handbooks. Yes, rather than have each uh, principal or each uh, level give uh, a presentation or read through the materials that they provided, um, I just have them each uh, on standby in case there was anything uh, in the proposed uh, revisions to handbooks that people uh, had questions about. So I think the only question that I had was the um, elementary handbook did not, the changes did not include adding the mask policy. So I was just wondering if that needed to be added to, to that handbook as well. I think the mask policy should be in each of the handbooks. So I can circle back to the elementary school principals and just ask them to make reference to the adopted mask policy. That's Great, a good thanks. Catch. Thank you. And sure. I noticed at the elementary level that at Glover, they talk about how student um, behavior, I forgot the exact term, but student behavior on remote is the, the expectation is the exact same as in the classroom. And I wonder if that's not something that should be at all the elementary school handbooks as well. And then my last question was, um, in my sense is that I understood it correctly, but that we've relaxed the attendance policy at the high school, we won't re be requiring um, a doctor's note and there will be no grade given of no credit for attendance. That is a great question. And I'm gonna go backwards and address the high school piece first because Dan Bauer and I met this morning to discuss that. And that's going to be a rescinded uh, recommendation for an update because Dan would like to consult with the faculty at the high school before making a change to that attendance policy. So what you would be voting tonight is no change to the attendance policy as written at uh, Marblehead High School. Um, and in terms of the elementary schools, yes, that would be a uniform expectation um, uh, among the elementary schools. Should we hold off on improving the high school be, until we have that language for the the app, um, the attendance, just because if we approve it right now, we're saying that in the middle of a pandemic, we're okay with the doctor note piece. And I, I think um, our, our local pediatricians and physicians will revolt on that. Um, you, you certainly can. Um, my experience has been that you can add an addendum or uh, to a handbook once it's uh, voted, if conditions change or circumstances uh, necessitate an update to the handbook. Uh, but we can certainly hold off on the MHS handbook if people, if the committee prefers that. My, my concern with that being, I know for the, for example, the pediatric practice in town, if you have a fever, they won't see you. So if a child is absent and needs a note, they'd have to go to an ER or an urgent care because the practice won't actually see you in person if, if you're symptomatic of anything. So we, we may be kind of sticking these families in a catch-22. So um, Emily and I have a policy subcommittee meeting tomorrow and there's a, there's a policy for the Title IX um, pieces that need to, need, needs to be looked at. So basically the intention is to, um, to be able to hopefully present that at some point next week and then vote it at our next regularly scheduled meeting. And so my anticipation honestly would be that we might have other COVID related policies to add at that point too, so that there is probably a reason to go back and add this addendum to the high school handbook regardless. So I, in my mind, I kind of wonder if it wouldn't just be worth having a past handbook for this, for the official start to school, knowing that we'll be back to look at these policies and probably add some things to the handbook before students ever even come into the school. Through the chair, that seems to make sense that maybe we hold off on officially voting on handbook changes until the second meeting of September, knowing that policy subcommittee is going to meet and make some recommendations. And if Dan, that would then allow Dan the opportunity to consult with the high school faculty about changes to the attendance policy. Okay. Can I ask a question? Do we have any requirements to have past handbooks before the start of school? I'm not sure I understand the question, Megan. Well, my understanding is we're legally required to vote the handbooks. Does that need to happen before the first day of students in school? I cannot answer that. I don't know. I could find out. 
since we're not here returning remote remotely, um, that might buy us uh, some time, but um, certainly you can vote them this evening and then vote to amend them at the second September meeting. You know, I, my, my understanding is we have to have another meeting, school committee meeting before we actually go back to approve the collective bargaining changes. So we'll be meeting before school starts back anyway. Why don't we just do this at the same time? That's okay with me. John, if that's, if that works for you, if you think yeah. that that, you know, hopefully Dan can get information on that. And then again, we would have the policy piece a little bit more ironed out Good. And then again, for, Meg, for Megan's, because Megan, that is, I have that concern as well, that we need to have something passed before uh, school actually starts. So that, that sort of helps us out on that too. So we'll be, we'll, we'll be passing it. And we can, if we don't have everything ironed out, we can look into whether or not it needs to be passed before school starts as well. So I guess you would entertain a motion to table approving handbooks this evening. So can I get a motion to table approving handbooks? So moved. Megan moved. Second. Emily second. Any concerns along that line before I call roll call? All right, Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor? Yes. Emily Barron? Yes. Sarah Fox? Yes. Yeah. And David Harris? Yes. Okay. So we will table them, looking for them to come back onto the agenda at the meeting that we'll discuss on our new business um, for next week. All right, that brings us up to the schedule of bills. Um, can I get a motion to approve the identified schedule of bills totaling $2,626,734.23? So moved. Megan moved. Second. David second. Any questions on those schedules or the invoices? There were several dates that were in the last fiscal year. One of them noted that it was a revolving fund, so I know that that's fine. The other ones, it, not, I didn't see that it noted a revolving fund. Um, so I just want to make sure that we're within the rules of what we can and can't do. Yes, some of the invoices were actually um, taken from our encumbrance um, funds. So there's a specific account number. Um, I apologize for if I did not make a note on the invoice. Um, also had to rescan some of the bills because some of them got cut off in the original scan and I had to rescan and so I didn't retranscribe my notes onto the second copy that got scanned in. So I apologize for that. But yes, no, the town has approved them all as well. They actually approved them as of today. And um, and usually they catch anything that I do not um, make a note on. So we are all set. I find it hard to believe you don't catch something, Michelle. <laughs> Once in a while. All right, um, I will call a roll call. Sarah Gold, yes. Megan Taylor. Yes. Emily Barron. Yes. Sarah Fox. Yes. And David Harris. Yes. All right. The schedule's passed five to zero. Michelle, you can stay on with us. Um, and that brings us to the FY20 closeout report. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I hope you all had a moment to at least glance at the memo and I do apologize. Um, for the lateness of it, but, and it does have a few typos, like spelling is not my strong point, numbers are, just keep that in mind, <laughs> as you see my typing memo, my typos. Um, so FY20 close was unlike any other we have ever seen. Um, obviously, you guys have been through challenging times in the past, but this certainly was a challenging year. Um, a lot of movement at year end. But we have finally closed our books. The town actually has not finished posting the entries just yet. So we do not yet have our general fund expenditure report that you would normally see on a monthly report. Um, but we will get that to you in the coming weeks as soon as all that is set. 
Um, but our total general fund expenditures after all our movement and all our reclassifications totaled $39,473,433. And this was from our operating budget of $39 million. Hold on, Michelle, you're muted. Yeah, can't hear. I am so sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, just talking away here. So um, yeah, FY20 was unlike any other year we've ever seen, obviously. Um, we've certainly had challenging times, but this was a challenge that no one really has experienced before. So we, um, we closed our books for FY20. The town has yet to finish posting all the journal entries and adjustments. So that's why you do not have your general fund um, expenditure report that you're normally used to seeing for each month. But as soon as that's available within a week or two, I will forward that to the committee. Our general fund total expenditures as of um, year end totaled $39,473,433. And, and this was from our operating budget of $39,624,425. We did have encumbrances totaling $85,248. Those were FY20 bills that had been incurred but had not yet been received as of um, the end of July. And those actually may have, be, may have been some of the invoices that you had seen on this past um, schedule of bills. But most of that amount was made up of, um, of some of the FOSS science kits that we ordered late in June using up some of the FY20 funds that we had discussed. And um, a good portion of that was also set aside for unemployment invoices, which had not yet been received. We actually just received those this week and we're in the process of um, reviewing those invoices. After all the expenditures and the encumbrances, which is the carry over into the FY21, um, or basically set aside, it's not really a carry over into 21, it's a set aside of FY20 dollars. Um, we have a final turn back to the town of $65,744. We had estimated that this amount would be between um, $50,000 and $100,000. So we are right in that targeted amount. So I'm um, happy to see that that played out as anticipated. We did have a number of adjustments that we had to make due to our unique situation. Um, one of our large deficits that we had to fund was the school lunch fund operations. Um, we had projected that this account would go into deficit and that's exactly what happened. Um, we had an operational deficit in the amount of $118,082, which we covered from the general fund. Um, in addition to that amount of money, uh, also discovered, which I knew we did have some prepaid accounts when a student prepays their lunch account, um, we technically hold that money, but it has not yet been earned per se. Um, we hold that amount for, on account for a parent or a student and um, they can request a refund at any time. So really that's not our funds and we should not be recognizing that as fully recognizable revenue, we need to put that aside. So those total prepaid accounts came to $47,578. So we wanted to make sure that we had this amount of funds on hand, um, especially because our refunds, our requests are coming in pretty frequent, frequently these days. So between the deficit and the amount that we need to have on hand for the prepaid accounts, we had a total um, adjustment of $165,660, which that brought that fund pretty much down to zero. And we will start over with the new fiscal year. Um, I'll talk about this, this account when we get to the COVID expenditures, um, because it is an account that we want to keep our eyes on as we move forward. The second large adjustment was the kindergarten and preschool tuition revolving fund. Um, this was another big talking point throughout the end of the fiscal year. We covered an operational deficit of $95,440. Um, and we also had collected tuition deposits and prepaid tuition in the amount of $50,639 for the kindergarten program. 
So we wanted to make sure we fully carried that over. And at the time, at the current time, we are in the process of refunding all those dollars, which will be done by the end of this month. Um, so with that adjustment, we um, were able to actually carry forward a balance into the new fiscal year of one hundred and sixty six thousand nine hundred and twenty six dollars. This was um, deliberate because we knew that we were going to run short in the new year, given the current pandemic situation. So we wanted to try to carry forward as much as much funding as we could into the new fiscal year. The third adjustment was um, a prepayment of special education out of district tuition costs in the amount of $200,000. We paid that actually on June 30th. And that was an agreement to reduce our FY21 operating budget. Um, so we do need to keep that in mind when we prepare our budget for next year, that this was a prepaid cost that, that um, was charged to our FY20 budget, not our FY21 budget. And the last adjustment um, we made, which really wasn't an adjustment, but it was ordering ahead and paying for one-time costs. Most of that was um, part of the FOSS science kits um, and some math curriculum. In addition, we paid some other small one-time costs. Um, this was all above board in agreement with the town. And um, basically this was to allow us to be able to shift some monies within the FY21 budget to create um, a capital line item in the FY21 budget to address some of our capital needs and not go to the town's capital fund for those needs. So that amount of money totaled $87,544. Um, after all those were made, I just went to um, give you a quick summary of the revolving account balances that have been carried forward. Um, They're in the bottom of that memo. So for user fee revolving fund, we have um, $31,736. Our tuition revolving fund for our student, our foreign students totaled $84,100. Our guidance revolving fund has a balance, a carry forward balance of $14,597. Our special education tuition fund has a carry forward balance of $75,740. Our building rent revolving fund has a carry forward balance of $82,569. Industrial arts revolving, $13,067. Kindergarten and preschool tuition that we just spoke about was $166,926. Athletic revolving was $26,353. Lost book revolving, $1,604. Fine Arts Revolving, 3,654. And our Circuit Breaker um, is technically a revolving account. Sometimes the, the town actually categorizes it as a grant, but it's a, it's a revolving fund from the state funds. Um, and that has a carry forward balance of $83,689. So our total revolving fund balance that we've been able to carry forward is $584,035. And that is about it for FY20. But if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Michelle. Anybody have any questions for Michelle? I do, but I'm willing to let the liaisons go first if they want. They, I'm sure they have questions. Go for it, sir. Um, OK, so the as far as the revolving funds go, I believe we can you is it true that we can use the i'm trying to pull it up now in front of me i'm sorry that we can use the building rental revolving fund to um pay custodial overtime or is it only for custodial overtime during that rental because i'm assuming we'll have quite a bit of that this year um we can use it for custodial rental i try not to use it for um, operating costs that would be considered an operating cost unless it was for a unique one-time situation Okay. Um, usually we just use it for the building rental, you know, piece. And, and then for the K tuition, does that, um, does that, in, does the number you presented to, to us account for keeping all teachers in paras whole, not reducing anybody's hours? Correct. Yes. Okay. 
and we will, um, we will get into that a little bit more when we talk about the COVID costs, but yes, that keeps all staff um, whole as, as okay. initially budgeted. And have you encumbered for the full school year, the additional um, disinfecting service? I think it was estimated to be what, about 30,000 a week? Yes, I have. That's in the COVID costs, but yes. But well, that's for the not, full school year? That's not the full school year. That's through December 31st. Our, co our COVID okay. funding um, expires on December 31st unless we receive an extension, which I do expect we will be. Okay. Um, so for that additional 30000 per week for the rest of the school year, do we have a funding source for that? That will be um, part of the town COVID funding costs. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get it to the COVID funding. Okay. Um, and we have, we have no problems with uh, making up the loss of revenue from the school lunch programs because we can't take that from COVID money, correct? We cannot take it from the CARES Act money. We can take it from our COVID line, COVID line item, but we are taking action to try to reduce some of those costs right now. Okay. Will there be a reduction in staff there? Yes, there will be. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions on the FY20 closeout? Michelle, I just want to say thank you for this and thank you for everything that you've done throughout the year. I mean, to be, on, to be honest, to come out where we are almost to the dollar of what you said we were going to do. Um, so I appreciate that. I know a lot of work's gone into it. Thank you. David? And, and I'd like to echo that. Um, welcome, Michelle. Thanks for your first closeout report coming to the district after Thanksgiving and working with our interns, interim superintendent, Bill McAuliffe, who basically handed off a bunch of spreadsheets to you. You've really done an awesome job. You really helped lead us into preparing a budget for fiscal 21 pre-COVID, um, but then worked through it with Bill as uh, the months went on. And this level of detail is, is very much appreciated. And um, I think it's really, I also wanna say, I think it's really good that we have continued to support the school lunch program and um, and fund and fund what is needed for the district and for for students um, that participate in that program and we'll work through that and and every other just adjustment that might come up whether it's kin you know the, the kindergarten tuition and all these things that are going to happen over the next couple of months so thanks for this report and um, I really appreciate it and I can also say, I mean, I know it's a it's an exceptional year and COVID contributed to some of the balances that we had in our budget, but it's really it's really good to see the open communication with the town and the town finance department. And when we were trying to close the gaps with the subcommittees working together to figure out how to prepay things and how could we make the budgets work. It was, it was just a really good process and, I, and I'm hopeful and confident that that will continue this year. So thanks. Thank you. Um, Michelle, one question that came up a few times at the athletics um, meeting is, it, reminded me when David said we recaptured savings. We reca I know we recaptured about 71,000 in savings from coaching salaries, um, but we'd already taken the, those user fees at the beginning of the year. Are we, are we concerned at all about how we might facilitate that again this year, paying a portion um, because families might not be inclined to pay a user fee at the beginning of the year if if there's no sports um, and just, can we talk to that a little bit? Cause I, am I correct in that we fund our sal coaches salaries 100% through the user's fee or does some of that come out of the operating budget? 
50% of the coaching salaries comes from the operating budget and 50 cent, 50% from user fees. Okay. Um, right now it's, it's quite a tricky situation, not knowing if we're going to have sports or a portion of sports or what we're going to do, because I would assume if our sports opportunities are reduced, then our coaching salaries will also be reduced. So um, uh, I'm hoping that would be a wash. Um, but as you see, you know, we do have some funds within the revolving funds. We can certainly be creative and moving around some of our operational costs that were really anticipated to be charged to a general fund and use them to the, um, use the specific reserve funds if we ever need to. Um, I should know that of the 584,000 in the revolving funds, really only 166,000 that's in the kindergarten tuition account is really earmarked at this time. So the rest of the funds really are not budgeted to be used anywhere in particular, um, which is a great thing because that's something with this level of uncertainty of what we're, we're encountering this year, um, we do have that flexibility. So as a school committee, when we talk about, you know, what, what this fall season looks like, and there's this idea of this three week potential or, or maybe something else of intramural play, will there be, and what would it be um, a user fee? Because although I, we all know our coaches aren't in this to get rich, they're here because they have a passion and they love it. Um, plus we see what we pay them. So they're clearly not getting rich on it. But um, I, I also think we can't ask them to volunteer. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. We need to keep that in mind as we move forward and, and figure out what we do in terms of a, a modified athletic season. Okay, thank you, Michelle. All right, Michelle, I think you can move forward on to the COVID related expenditures update. Okay, COVID updates a little more exciting than year end, a um, little more challenging than year end as well. So as we are currently um, preparing to open the, the school year and welcome students back, um, we have so many costs that are changing on a daily basis. Um, I have outlined the anticipated COVID-19 related costs. It's on this, the third page of the memo that is in the drop box. Um, the sheet also includes the total CARES Act and COVID funding currently available to the district, to the school district and not the town necessarily. Um, the current expenditures total $1,875,750. This is a number that is very fluid and um, it includes actual costs paid to date, costs incurred to date, as well as anticipated costs to come. Um, and most of these costs are projected through at least December. Um, at that point is when the current CARES Act funding is set to expire. I do anticipate that it will be extended. Um, and I do think there is, um, I was talking to the finance director today, there is some additional town funding that we will be able to use if the situation continues and that date is extended. So all the COVID funds that have been awarded through either the Department of Education or um, to the town have been part of the overall CARES Act. So the CARES Act, we have received two grants from the Department of Education or DESE, um, one in the amount of $91,612, which is a grant that we can actually use over two and a half years. Um, not a lot of money that we can carry forward, but it is something. And the second grant is in the amount of $653,175. And that grant also expires on the December 31st date. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, also, we have an align item that we created at the 11th hour in our FY20, FY21 budget process um, for COVID related funding of $168,699. That can be used for anything, basically. It's in our operating budget. Um, we earmarked it for COVID-related costs, but we can um, decide what to use that on. 
And lastly, we are able to close any gap with a good portion of the town's funding that they have received from the CARES Act. They received a commitment of 1.8 million. Um, at the current time, we are anticipating using just under a million dollars, and that will take us through the December 31st projections. Um, there is additional funding available under that allotment. And it should also be noted that of that 1.8 million, that is actually after any FEMA reimbursements. Um, I am not involved in the actual FEMA reimbursements. Those are handled completely on the town side. But anything that we send to the town in terms of a COVID related invoice, if it meets the FEMA guidelines, then the town submits to FEMA for reimbursement um, and they will get some funding back on that. Or if it does not meet the FEMA guidelines and it's just a strictly COVID related cost, that's not necessarily a PPE or um, cleaning item, then it gets taken out of that $1.8 million um, allotment that the town received. So certainly we have a lot of, lot of moving parts, but there is a significant amount of funding available to um, meet all of our needs. On the estimated expenditure sheet, the last two lines on that indicate, um, I've separated out, it's a, it's a revenue shortfall, one for the tuition revolving fund um, of for the kindergarten revolving account that um, we'll get into details in just a minute. And the second is for food service fund. Um, those two lines total $150,000. That is just a rough guesstimate at this time. The kindergarten revolving is an exact figure, but the food service revolving is um, an estimate at this time. So this particular shortfall cannot be charged to the CARES Act funding, but it can be charged to our operating line item of that $168,000 that we had earmarked for COVID related costs. So at this point, that is how we plan on addressing those two particular revenue shortfalls with that particular line item. So to dive into the kindergarten revolving fund, um, we touched upon that at the FY20 close out memo. Um, back in, there's a chart on the second page of this memo. Back in March, when we set the FY2021 20, budget, we had anticipated um, having a beginning balance of zero dollars, receiving a revenue, tuition revenue in the amount of $529,000. We had budgeted teaching and paraprofessional salaries totaling $423,000 coming from those funds. Health insurance and Medicare tax, payroll tax benefits being charged to the fund of about $105,000 and other expense items um, for kindergarten registration, which totaled 529,000 as well, which brought our projected balance down to zero. Since March, obviously when the um, COVID situation first arose, we have had this particular account on the forefront of our minds. Um, even at the end of June, when we were finalizing the budget, we knew that you know, any additional savings in the salary line items would have to be focused and applied here. So as of the current time, we were able to carry forward a balance of the $166,926. We are anticipating a revenue of $45,000 that is for the enrolled preschool tuitions that have not, um, not with, been withdrawn from the program that are still planning on continuing to attend. So that will give us total funding the amount of $211,926. So to use that line item, um, that funding source, we are planning on charging salaries of $179,062, benefits of $24,308, and the um, same other expense for registration items. So this will leave us a projected balance, year-end balance of just over $7,500 in the revolving tuition account for kindergarten and preschool. We were able to shift $243,938 to the operating budget for the existing salaries. 
To date, we've been able to absorb 175,000 of that 243. Um, that leaves us with a balance of $68,350 that we have not yet been able to absorb um, within the salary budget. This is the amount that I am recommending at the current time that we earmark um, a portion of those COVID funds within the operating budget. I do believe that um, the situation will actually improve. We will have additional salary budget savings. It seems to be a moving target, but every single day it seems to be getting better and better. Um, unfortunately, it's due to a large number of staff turnovers. Um, a large number of leaves of absences. We are filling the positions, but we're filling them at a much lower cost, which is a great thing, um, especially if it's a temporary thing. And this is also a temporary situation. So two temporary situations will wash each other out. And we're not making permanent changes, um, which is a great thing. So at this time, I do expect that we will be using the 68,000 from that COVID line. Um, that leaves the rest of the line essentially for um, to address any shortfall in the food service line. Um, as I did mention, we are reducing staff or furloughing some of our cafeteria staff. We have asked for volunteers to um, be furloughed, um, which will qualify them for unemployment as well as will enable them to maintain their health insurance benefits if they had qualified for that. Um, this will be a cost reduction to that fund. In addition, we are um, reducing some salary, some hours in other um, cafeteria workers. So we are working through those numbers um, just as we speak right now. And once we have a better projection on that, we will um, report that out. And also the USDA did announce earlier this week, or maybe it was late last week, that free meals will continue for all students through December 31st. So this also means that we will not be collecting um, fees for lunches or for breakfasts. Um, those meals will be provided free of charge to any student who wishes to receive them. Um, so that will certainly um, be a continual revenue source for us as long as the students are requesting the meals. So that, so we are also trying to think outside of the box of other ways to increase um, participation, maybe in terms of staff um, or in terms of putting together maybe some goodie packages that a parent can order to have delivered to um, an in staff appreciation. So we're trying to think outside of the box about how to increase our revenue because our um, actual meal revenue will be limited with the USDA free meals for all. So, but we will be working through those figures and um, I hope you know, within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to report out what we are projecting in terms of the um, school lunch revolving fund for that. And just lastly, on the last page of that memo, I um, indicated a description of each category or how I categorized each of the COVID costs, you know, whether it's cleaning supplies, a facilities cost at HVAC or air quality um, cost, PPE, technology, um, signage, storage trailers, et cetera. And um, it totals that 1,875,000 um, that I referred to before. And that just gives you an indication of what we are anticipating for total expenditures. And I did note that this is through December 31st, um, but we, do, we will have some additional funding available if the government extends that deadline and um, the town does not incur any additional costs, which they're not expecting to at this time. Any questions? Michelle, can you just clarify that last piece? Do you expect just that the date will extend or that there will actually be additional funds as well? Um, at this time, I, I am pretty confident that the, the date will definitely extend. Um, I do not know if there will be additional funding, but I, I think if you know, knowing that we're not going to have a vaccine, I, I read just today that most people are not, or the CDC is not anticipating that most people will not be vaccinated until next summer. I think that the current situation is going to go on through, you know, pretty much the end of the school year. 
So I'm hoping that the date is extended through the end of the school year, as well as hopefully additional, some additional funding will be coming to us. Um, but a lot of these costs that we have incurred are one-time costs. Um, some of them are ongoing costs and will depend how, how long we are actually in session with students in our schools. Thank you. Michelle, one quick question. Um, the USDA piece that you were talking about, I know one yes. of the ideas on making up some revenue had been to be able to offer lunches to go home with students who may not be interested in the, the, the kind of prepackaged one, but some other types of lunches. Um, does that limit that ability? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. That's the first I'm hearing about it, but it... Maybe that was an idea that got floated and, yeah. and taken off. <laughs> to say, it didn't make it to me just yet, um, but that's something to look into, definitely. I'm not, not sure if that's a possibility. It may be. Thanks. So you noted these... Um, your write-up was to carry us through December 31st, but was the portion pertaining to kindergarten tuition only through December 31st, or was that encumbering for the full year? Kindergarten tuition was actually the full year. Okay. Um, and then for those other expenses, we're looking at roughly a third of the school year we, we're, we're taking a little more than half the schools we're going to take a large chunk um and they've been very supportive but do we is it realistic to think that we're we're looking at a third of the year of our COVID expenses and if we stay in the school for the full year that we'll have enough I mean I know you said some of these were one time but yeah I mean most of, of our tech most of our technology costs are, are just one-time costs. Um, we have ordered a significant amount of hardware, totaling over $400,000. Um, our software is also one-time costs as it covers the entire year. Um, mm -hmm. Technology services that I have anticipated is to basically get our hardware up and running. So really the operational costs are going to be cleaning services, um, temporary cleaning services, and um, any additional PPE that we need. Um, we have ordered a good chunk probably to take us through between four to five months. Um, we had to order an astronomical amount based on DESE guidelines. We certainly do not think we're going to utilize the amount they estimated um, in, a, in a month's time. So honestly, I think that the amount we have on hand could, could take us through half of the year. Um, with that being said, the signage is a one-time cost. Um, the student desks were a one-time cost. The student services will be a, a front end um, heavy loaded cost and when, as we bring these students back into school. So I think a lot of these, and obviously, and not, not just um, go off on a tangent, but the HVAC assessment, that is a, a one-time cost for right now as well. So I think a lot of these one-time costs will go away, but the, the primary um, continual cost will be the temporary custodial staffing that we're bringing in. And the revolving, uh, the shortfalls of the revolving fund for the, the food service? Correct, yes. Okay, um, so that could potentially be anywhere from like another 800 to maybe a million, those, those, those continuing costs. Um, and do we have a rough esti estimate of, I know we'll have to pay a portion of the unemployment of the people that are furloughed. Is that in these numbers at all? Um, it is not currently in these numbers because the amount that we're going to be responsible for is going to be probably pretty minimal. Um, and in addition, they will qualify for any federal add-on that is voted. Um, I know currently there was an um, additional amount voted through or, or approved through the end of August. There is an expected additional amount, hopefully, that will be coming that will be provided to these employees, but will not be charged to us. Um, so we do not think it's going to be that large. Um, but we also can use the CARES Act to pay for um, the unemployment costs. It is an allowable. Cost. Oh, excellent. So that wouldn't count as loss of revenue. Correct. 
Okay, good. Um, so you're confident that that if we go through the end of the school year, we can find that possible eight hundred thousand to a million. I think so. Between um, between what the town has available, the FEMA funding that they're going to get back to basically um, bring their one point eight million to a higher number, um, and we are obviously the largest user of that one point eight million. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have pretty much committed to um, saving every every opportunity they can in the CARES Act to make sure that all of our, our, our needs are met. So I, I am confident in that. And honestly, um, given the current school year, it's not going to be operations as normal. So I do expect some savings, whether it be um, transportation, SPED tuitions, a lot of our, our special ed programs are actually operating in a remote situation now um, from our out of district schools. So there's gonna be some, some transportation savings there. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts right now that we have our eyes on that we're, we, we're not quite yet certain, but I'm, I'm confident that we will be able to make this work. Okay. I am not and concerned. That's really that's really good to hear about the outplacement transportation because that's such a huge driver. I was concerned where you can transport fewer people in a vehicle that that actually was going to go skyrocketing. But you're saying we, we're going to recoup some savings there. So that's really huge. It could. I mean, the students that we are transporting, the, those costs may skyrocket, but we also have some situations where we no longer need to transport a student. So um, okay. So there's, there's a lot of moving parts that we're, we're trying to keep track of right now, but without us actually being in um, session yet and without some of these schools not yet being in session, it's it's really a, a guessing game. David, Thank you, you, Michelle. Your, your numbers are always so easy to um, kind of understand and go through. Thank you so much for the way you break it down and present. No problem, you're welcome. David, did you have a question? Uh, I did, I did, Michelle, if the, <clears throat> clearly the two biggest expenses on this other than cleaning, I guess we could say is uh, custodial temporary staffing and the technology for hardware. Could you just, um, are these assumptions that this can, the first thing I guess is I'm sort of always a little bit more glass half full that things will get better, but these assumptions and what you've encumbered are for expenses for the entire year. Um, but also, could you just also talk about the custodial temporary staffing and the technology hardware that we're spending $400,000 on? The technology hardware that we have spent um, just over the 400,000 that encompassed um, ordering 490 Chromebooks for students. And that included ordering 260 iPads. Um, those are on order. Some of the Chromebooks we have already received. The second shipment, we have been um, informed that we, we have our orders in and we should receive those probably within the next month. Um, our iPads, I believe we have received those. If not, they are coming very shortly. Um, so those are certainly one-time costs. We did anticipate acquiring some hardware this year, but nowhere near those amounts. Um, so certainly the CARES Act has benefited us in, in this regard where we got a, a large number of um, hardware devices that we initially did not anticipate before this whole remote learning situation and, and, about. and those those devices will go to students in need that that don't necessarily have them correct uh, okay yes we we have committed to providing mm -hmm. devices to any student who needs a device um in order to, for, for a remote learning situation absolutely or if we're in a hybrid situation that might be technology that can be used in in both instances um in the school as well as at home. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yep. Right. So obviously that that cost will not be reoccurring whatsoever um, because we have that that large influx of the technology. Um, the custodial the custodial temporary staffing. Um, we're currently ballparking it at about thirty thousand a week. 
uh, we have an RF or an RFP or an IFB information information for bids um, or invitation for bids. I'm sorry. Um, out currently on the streets, we will have bids due on September 14th. At that time, we will have an indication of what the actual rates will be. Um, we're anticipating bringing in additional custodial staff of about 30 people per week, um, pretty much on a daily full-time basis. Yeah. Um, currently, we do have a number of vacancies, um, they're temporary vacancies in our custodial staff. We have two people currently out on workers' comp. Um, we have another one out um, just on extended sick leave. And, um, and we, I believe we have another position not yet filled. So right now we are down four custodians on a regular basis. That's certainly that that's hurting us, but <coughs> The custodians that are on extended leave are not are no longer being paid, so that does result in some um, staff savings as well, and that has not been added into our salary budget. Right, but it, it's it's about anticipated expenses to keep the schools clean. Exactly. And exactly. having having this temporary staff come in. Right. Yeah. Okay. So really, that's that's the only ongoing cost that I see besides the cleaning supplies, but we. We really hit the cleaning supply ordering hard because we were afraid that the products just would not be available. Um, right. The amount right. of hand yep. sanitizer we have on hand, the amount of disinfecting wipes we have on hand is just astronomical. I honestly believe that we will make it through the whole entire school year with what we have. Right. If you walk over to Vets Middle Ooh. School, you will not believe the amount that we have um, on hand. So I, I think that that number is pretty much set for the year. Okay. Um, I don't expect that to be increasing too much either. So really the, the one piece that will be ongoing is the custodial staffing. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Storage trailers just for our cleaning supplies. <laughs> Some of it's cleaning supplies, most of it's furniture that we had to remove from the just classroom. Kidding. <laughs> Michelle, do you anticipate any savings? You know, in the spring we had voted um, to carry over a certain percentage of the coaching stipends that were out. So if, obviously if we do any piece of sports, there's gonna be stipends paid out. But if, if for whatever reason we can't pull off a season, um, does that, did those percentages carry through or would we revote them or do you, are, are there going to be any anticipated savings or, or expenditures with that? Um, I would recommend that we take that issue up um, given whatever, whatever happens with the new seasons um, because that was very specific to the um, spring season where we were just about literally to start I think the day after we closed um, and some prep, some preparation had been done at that time and, and coaches really He's were so expecting quiet. to work um, and had put in some, some time. At this point, obviously our seasons really have not started. Um, so we sh certainly should take that um, issue up for discussion, you know, going forward with, with whatever happens, whether we have pretty much a full season or we have a half a season or um, we barely have any of a season, but I think we should take that up. But yes, we have an amount, you know, 50% of the coaching salary is budgeted in the operating budget. The other 50% is um, slated to come from user fees. So certainly if the coaching salaries were reduced to just 50% and we did have some user revenue, we would see some savings. Um, in addition, obviously the, tr the athletic transportation issue is unknown. Um, we don't know, you know, what transportation will look like. We obviously have guidelines that we need to follow, um, but we also have a, a new school bus that we have on order currently. So we will actually have a fleet of four full-size school buses um, for Marblehead schools, and um, maybe we can utilize some of that. That should be um, received, I believe, in November. We're looking at receipt of that new bus. At this time, we are also um, possibly looking at leasing two additional special ed vans 
that we had anticipated for this budget. We honestly have not had a moment to put out bid, bid specs for those. Um, and because we are limiting our transportation to only students that we re are required to transport, transport either due to the distance from their school or because of an IEP requirement, um, our transportation numbers um, of students has been greatly reduced. So we're taking all that into consideration as we you know, look forward into our busing needs and transportation needs from um, outside vendors as well. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, just a quick question, and my, Todd may be the one to answer this, but you're the one that informed us, so I'm gonna throw it at you, sorry. Um, those four custodians that were down, um, given that we're in a pandemic, and are, will, are we confident those positions will be filled or those people will be back to work before we have students in schools and in fuller buildings? Um, two of them are on a longer term workers comp situation. Um, I do not anticipate those two people to be back. And um, both of those are currently off of our payroll. So we do have savings. And if we need to hire either temporary staff or apply portion of their savings to the contracted temporary staffing, we can certainly do that. But those those okay. vacancies were taken into consideration when you know when Todd came up with the number of thirty additional bodies um, needed okay. for um, to address our needs. Okay, I just want to make sure Todd has what he needs. Yep. Oh, I'm sure he could use a, a hundred people, but um, we're trying to be reasonable, and he's 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 been great about that. He tries to do things you know in the most economical um, way, but sometimes we need to spend the money to to meet our needs. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, your updates are always fantastic. We really appreciate it and all the details and the ability to ask all these questions and, and have them answered. It's amazing. No problem. Um, that will move us on to school community community school committee communications and discussion. Um, I am gonna ask that we actually table the resolution discussion that's on the agenda for this evening. Um, it, it would require a vote and I missed the fact that um, a vote didn't get noted on there. So we will table that one and then move it to the 17th. Um, and actually Emily had talked with me earlier today about getting another resolution on for the 17th. So that'll enable us to talk about a couple of resolutions um, at the same time and, um, and, and vote on, on them if we feel that that's necessary. Derek, can I just request that we read the proposed resolution to the public? Cause I think that one is pretty impactful so that I think the public would like to hear it before. I, I actually thought we wasn't on for a vote so that we present it to the public so that the next time we can hear feedback on it in public comment before we vote. I thought the lack of a vote was intentional. Um, I mean, I'm not opposed to reading it. I, I guess I would just, um, I, I, I guess I would just prefer to move it along. I mean, it's after nine. Um, if we're not gonna, if we're not gonna have a discussion on it this time, it'll definitely be back up next time for sure. Because I agree, you know, it is a resolution that we want to, to discuss and, and hopefully um, move forward with a vote on it. Um, so, and and one, one thing, though, Sarah, just to add on to that is that next week, if we decide that we want to think about it, we don't necessarily have to vote on either of them next week either if we just want to kind of attack it then and, and allow for public comment the following one or for us to think about it um, a little bit. So there's no vote mandated next week either. It's just, you know, let's move it along since we've got a number of other things on our agenda still. Can we make it available to the public on the back together, Marver, Heather, wherever? Yeah, I think that makes sense on this one because it is a COVID related uh, resolution. So I think as long as John is okay with that, um, I think that makes a lot of sense. So we can get that up um, as soon as possible. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll not, we'll look at that one again on the 17th. Um, not because we've talked about it, we're, we'll hammer out that other, um, off cycle meeting in new business, but the, this one will go on with the regularly scheduled meeting. 
Um, so that will look, move us on to the School Advisory Council discussion. Um, Emily, I will turn it over to you. Uh, I know you and John worked on this offline as discussed. Um, okay, so John and I met after the last meeting um, and we came up with alternatives to having school committee members on the school advisory councils at our various schools. Um, and we tried to create uh, new ways to create or increase visibility and approachability of the school committee within the district with parents and families and staff. Um, and so some of the things we came up with were our, our learning walks where um, John would have regularly scheduled walks through um, schools with the superintendent, the principal and one sc um, school committee member. And they would tour the school, be able to ask the principal questions. Um, and these could be scheduled once a week if you know we would schedule with John, we can go see every school and he throughout the school year, we will have those schedules for all of us to see each school and meet with each principal. The second idea or to add on to that is six for the sixth grade, the middle and high school to have pizza lunches to um, so to get 10 to 15 students have lunch and a school committee member would meet with them, have them ask questions, bring up concerns. Um, so that's a way for us to get um, in front of actual students. The next idea is to have one to two school committee members sit in um, on faculty meetings. Then another um, event that could be scheduled are school committee uh, member coffees with parents. So. Again, one to two school committee members can hold morning coffees um, or also, I guess, evening coffees or tea um, to talk with parents. And so again, parents can act direct questions to the school committee. And um, the next thing is to have the school principals present um, to, at our school committee meeting. So each meeting a principal would present just a short school related update, um, 10 to 15 minutes long to just, you know, tell us what's going on in the schools. And then the last thing is to have a school committee member attend the central council meetings, which are the meetings of the presidents of the PTOs and PCOs in the district. And so that's a way for the school committee to see another aspect um, of the district and what's going on. And then with all of these people, the school committee members could have the option to report back to us to see what they've learned, if things came up, um, and then we can talk about it. So those are some of the options that we came up with in our meeting. And I thought they were great ideas to really get us out there and get us talking with people and learning and um, meeting everybody. So I guess we can talk about it. I don't know how people want to. Yeah, absolutely. We should definitely open this up. How they feel about it. Yeah, um, I, I like I like all of those ideas. They're really good ideas. And I think, um, interestingly, they might put us into the community and into the schools in a, in a more effective and impactful way than maybe even the SACs right. have had in the past. I love the pizza lunch idea. I'm down for that. <laughs> now, I'm assuming a lot of these will, will be after the COVID piece is kind of behind us. For instance, the, the pizza lunch in the touring of the schools, because we won't want to be doing any of this and right. putting people more at risk. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, a lot of this, th these are like a year out. Um, I personally really like the way we've done the SACs. I felt like it's extremely collaborative. It it makes the school committee members part of an equal team with, you know, our community members, our teachers, our administrators. And I've had the opportunity for five years now to serve on them. And I've I've found it extremely beneficial, whether it's, you know, as a school committee member or as the parent rep, um, to kind of all work together as a team towards common goals. And I worry that doing away with them will further kind of silo us 
I worry, I worry that some of our procedures lately are feeling like we're kind of siloing ourselves a little bit. Um, but that's just my point of view, and it's to the will of the committee. Um, I actually, I don't, I don't know how if we, you know, I, could, I think if we did away with the SACs, I could see that that would be siloing ourselves um, completely. But I think if we opt for a different way of of interacting with the public and the and the schools and the principals, um, I don't know. I actually think um, again. I think that these are more effective ways quite frankly, than, than the SACs. Um, I certainly have enjoyed my time on the SACs, um, but I always felt a bit like an observer. Um, and I don't know, I guess that just is sort of, I always feel that it, it that it, there needs to be some, I don't know, is this some mindfulness around how when, when a school committee member walks into a situation um, that, that they're there with their school committee cap. Um, and so I kind of like this idea of, of sort of being dispersed a little bit better. You know, I might be the only person who served on one as a non-school committee member. Cause I, I, like I said, I've you know, I've been doing this for five years now, and I really didn't see that anybody acted different or that anything changed. Um, and that was one of the pieces I, I liked so much of the, the SACs. It was, it really felt very equalized, very collaborative. Um, I never felt like an observer. I always felt like we, we just, you know, I got to see what, what the school did, how they did it, how they worked. Um, I, I've enjoyed all my time there. So... I think that I would I would see it as a loss, but Megan. So I know I say this every time it comes up. I love the village SAC meetings. I love them. They're my favorite meet of all school committee meetings because I learn so much about what's happening in the school. And I, I say it every time, the passion, the excitement, the enthusiasm, I love it. That said, I'm not sure how much value I add to their process. So my question would really be, what do the principals want us to do for the SACs? So I would, you know, I'd really like that input. That said, all these ideas, Emily, that you and John are presenting are things I would like to do no matter what. Um, because I think, you know, when we went through the superintendent search, and we did the walkthroughs of the buildings with the superintendent and the principal. Those were, you know, obviously a great window to see, you know, John's skills and how he interacts, but it's also a great way for us to see what was going on in the schools and here. So, you know, I would absolutely like to do more of those no matter what, um, you know, and I think we've historically, you know, before everything kind of went sideways, um, we were having our meetings at the individual schools, you know, once a year. Um, and so we haven't really been able to do that in a while. And I think probably this year would be the same thing, but if we're having the principals and maybe even some of the students and teachers come to our meetings and, and present some of the great thing that's going, going on in the schools, even in a remote or a hybrid situation, that would be useful as well. So, um, you know, any way that I think we can get more involved in what's happening in the actual buildings and with our students, I think is a great thing. I think that's a great point that you made, Megan. And I was hoping that these ideas would get us there, like to get us out in the schools, all of us can go to all of them, you know, and really see what's happening during the day. Um, and I think that's so important that we all get to have that opportunity to go and actually meet with everybody and see. Because um, when I went to the central council meetings, when I was the PTO president, hearing what every other school was doing, it's like you felt more connected to everybody in the district instead of your little, your own school that you were so invested in and hearing what, every, and like what everyone else, their events and just um, everything that goes on, there's so much more, so I think it's great for all of us to really go see what's happening um, in our schools. 
And I actually wonder how much of this we could pull off realistically this year. Um, you know, like the lunches with students, obviously it would be probably ill-advised to meet in person with the students, but there were plenty of times last spring when, um, you know, that I would hop on at Tower with a, for a lunch with students um, and, you know, one grade would be getting together and teachers would be there and students would be there and, and we'd chit chat and sometimes the conversation would be serious and sometimes it would be um, silly and it was a nice way to just kind of encourage community. Um, so I actually, actually think something like that and the possibly the coffees um, and even the you know I, I would assume that the central council things would be on zoom um, that some of these we it might be an interesting year to actually look at this because the SAC meetings might be different I know certainly when COVID knocked everything off kilter last spring the SAC meetings um, didn't happen quite as often. So I wonder if this might be a nice test run for this in an odd year anyway. That's a good point. And at the end of the day, they're public meetings. So anybody that still wants, any of us who still want to partake in them can and, and will. So we don't have a vote on this one either. Um, so do we want to do we want to take the next two weeks to kind of think about it and come back? Or you know, Emily, do you have a a way that you want to see us handle it? Um, um I think the faster or the like as soon as we can get our decision made because if we do want to get some of these things happening um in this first part of the school year you know we have to schedule mm -hmm. all of that so um, well i think we should probably move forward i mean i don't see them as mutually exclusive many of your ideas even if we keep sacs as right. they were are good are, okay. are yeah. can be implemented i don't i actually don't see them having any bearing whatsoever on sacs can I, can I ask a clarification? And you may have said this, so I apologize, but with coming up with these ideas, um, have you, and John, I'm sorry, you may have already told us this, have you um, consult, you know, talked to the principals and got their feedback on these? So I'll jump, <laughs> jump in there. Um, yeah. I think Sarah Fox's point is very well taken that they are public meetings. And so if school committee members wish to participate in them, um, I think it is a good idea to explore new ways for school committee members uh, to be involved in the life of the schools, perhaps not as voting members uh, of an SAC. And I think that that is a good position for the new superintendent, not obligating building principals to the outcome of this decision. How's that for a walk around? That's, that's a pretty good never around. voting yeah. members <laughs> but that, just sorry, so you sir. know we were never voting members yeah. we were non-voting members yeah. well i'm good with getting some of these you know okay. going personally mm -hmm. i like them so john asked me to make a calendar and put them all on the calendar so i can get going on that all right that sounds like a plan. Bring it back. All right. Great. Thank Great. You. Thank you guys. All right. That brings us to subcommittee updates. Um, and this was something that we worked on keeping on agendas in the past, in the past year. Um, so I just wanted to really stay the commitment on that, that we would have subcommittee updates regularly at meetings. Um, I know that obviously we're kind of all flying by the seat of our pants here. And so and most subcommittees are not scheduled to meet yet, um, but just to kind of keep it on everybody's radar. Um, Emily and I are scheduled to meet for the policy subcommittee tomorrow morning. Um, and um, we did choose to have that meeting in person and um, at Widger Road. Um, that was, you know, I think as we look as a district, 
to return to as normal functioning as we can return to. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense to be attempting as the school committee to return to as much normal as we can return to as well. Um, so that was the thinking behind that. Um, you know, it's, it is obviously a public meeting. We've consulted the AG's office. Um, if it, you know, we'll have chairs for the public set out and socially distanced and masks will be required. Um, if we get to a number who come that uh, the space is, is too small for it. Lisa's booked a bigger space in that in that same in at in Widger Road and we can always move it outside as well. It looks like it's gonna be beautiful tomorrow. Um, so that's the plan on that. Um, and like I said earlier in the meeting, hopefully we'll have some, some policy updates to hand to the committee uh, next week when we meet um, about the MOA. And then that will give us the opportunity, you know, for the mask policy, we kind of, did an emergency uh, reading with it and got it passed with just one reading. Ideally, policy, you know, is discussed at the subcommittee level, brought to the full committee uh, for an initial reading and then to a subsequent meeting for its final reading and vote. So ideally, that's what we're looking to do moving forward with these policies that that we'll start to look at tomorrow. Um, as as per the having the meeting in person, um, I would like to see moving forward that any in-person meeting also have some type of video link. Um, my understanding is we're the only community and actually not even community, we're the only board in the entire North Shore area hosting in-person meetings, partic particularly indoors. So I, I feel like there's this idea in the community where it's not as accessible at being a pandemic and all um, that we we, in order for this idea of collaboration with the community and transparency that I would like to see us always offer a video option as well um, so that the community can, can, can um, you know, zoom in or YouTube in or whatever it is that they do um, and be part of these meetings. I think the idea that we're constantly gonna be hopping from room to room or possibly outside and crossing our fingers that the weather's okay moving forward isn't the best plan. Um, and also I think for, you know, the argument being made that we're moving towards putting students in school, students in school in a public meeting are two completely different beasts. It's like comparing an apple to a Cadillac in my mind, um, bringing students in school were, were meticulously organized. We know what students are coming, when they're coming, where they're going, where they've been. We can contact trace, we have seating charts. Um, it's very organized, very meticulous. Um, we can plan for safety. A public meeting by its nature, very nature is you cannot limit or dictate who comes and from where. So if there is a need for contact tracing, we, I don't know that we've established a protocol for that. Um, and I, I'm concerned with having in-person meetings without a protocol for contact tracing. If there is a positive, how do we trace who was in that room, where they sat, this and that. Um, I just, I don't feel our protocols are there yet for to safely do it. And cause we can't control who comes to a public meeting. It's an entirely different beast. So I, I can understand completely the idea that we don't want the public saying, you know, well, you're, you're, you're zooming still, but you're putting kids in buildings. They're entirely different beasts. You can control one who comes and goes and the other one, we have zero control and follow through on as far as contact tracing. Um, so I think, you know, that's a, that's a well taken point. Um, and certainly as we move as a committee to, uh, to meet mostly in person as the school committee members, those meetings would absolutely have a, a Zoom component for public participation, as well as uh, public viewing, hopefully on multiple platforms. Um, and I think, you know, I, I just, as wonderful as Zoom is to be a stand-in for these types of things, that, that it's allowed us to do business, it's allowing us to um, run classes and, and, and be effective and, and move society forward. Um, it certainly does not, is not as easy to use as in-person meetings. Um, and I just really don't wanna see us struggle to get business done um, while we kind of trip over ourselves to run 
Zoom meetings as well, it, well worth also running in person because it's not it's not the easiest thing to do as you're trying to participate in a meeting and control a wait room and manage any kind of um, you know Zoom bombing situation that might come up. Um, so I think you know for the it that for the subcommittees at least where we don't tend to get vast amounts of public participation to begin with. Um, for myself, it just made some sense to be able to start to meet in person. I mean, we're not talking about moving 100 people from room to room. I will say the budget meetings, I mean, we've been packed elbow to elbow. I mean, I can, I can tell you, I could, you know, I can remember Paul Baker on many occasions being, you know, right next to me, um, which it's great that people are involved and want to be there. But the idea that we're going to fit the people that are interested six feet apart in these rooms. I don't know. I think the budget one is one that we should, um, you know, we're going to have to plan for a little bit. I'd like to see much more regularly scheduled budget meetings than maybe we did in the past and also you know we know that we have interest there so we have to plan accordingly especially when we're talking about space um you know that's probably the one where we do get the most interest and we have to plan accordingly for that but i will say like i absolutely think there our meetings were more effective and efficient when we were in person um and you know what we're doing there is those are more like working meetings and we bring everything back to the school committee. So it's not like we're making any decisions um, in those subcommittee meetings. They're actually, like I said, they're more working and then we bring them back to the full school committee for discussion, votes and action to be taken. Um, and those I do think that we should, you know, still make a hunt, you know, continue in this form for accessibility, um, you know, for the, for at least the, you know, short to medium term. Um, the policy one, you know, being on the policy <laughs> subcommittee for the past two years, We've never, uh, I can't say never, maybe once we had some person come, um, you know, so I think we, you know, we know the ones that we should expect, um, you know, greater attendance and we have to plan accordingly for that. Um, but I don't think it should preclude us from trying to work as effectively as possible. And I do think the in-person ones get us a little bit further along on that. You can still have an in-person meeting. You just would in my opinion, you would also, you know, have it available to people who aren't in the room or can't be in the room. Um, you know, part of an, uh, an open meeting is being accessible and, and there are people with health and underlying conditions where we're making it non-accessible to them. It's an accessibility issue too, I think. Yeah, but I think, again, as Megan pointed out, this is a piece where no actual decisions are made um, that are going to be carried forward to the district. You know, it's all planning and that it's brought back to the full committee, which there is absolutely a commitment to being um, continuing to be in, within Zoom and, and online um, in, in multiple formats. I mean, you know, we're recording this. It's everybody has access to Zoom and it's being streamed live on YouTube. Um, so it, you know, there's, there's certainly is a, is a, is a dedicated commitment to having people be able to access when decisions are being made. Does anybody else have any, um, plans to, to, to put a subcommittee meeting on the books at any point? Are we still working? Uh, David and I have actually started talking about what's going to work schedule-wise, and I do think, you know, like I said, especially for budget, that's probably one where we want to get a more regularly scheduled meeting um, in place, A, for, you know, our own schedules, but also just, you know, so the public's aware and we can kind of start working with the town on that too. Right. Fantastic. Well, I know Emily and I will have things to report on uh, this policy subcommittee. I think it might be a busier year with that one um, as we work to bring things forward. David, school building project update. Is there any chance you can share your screen with me? Just briefly. 
I can I make you do you have it? Can I give you co host abilities? Right. If you do that, I guess. And then, then you can okay. share your screen. Yep. No, it's, it's there. It's there. So can people see that? Here we go. Is this visible? Yep. Okay. And, and I won't do the whole um, five minutes of the video, but um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we had the topping off ceremony and MHTV was nice enough to put together this video. Um, and I'm just going to do the, you know, the first minute of the video because I think it's really cool and for people to see, even if they're logging on and have already seen it, but so here we go. So I will stop there to spare everybody, but um, uh, thanks, John. Uh, put you on the spot a little bit there. Tuesday morning and asking you to make a few remarks and uh, hadn't asked in advance, but you know, after all, it, you know, it, it's about this. It's about the students. It's about the kids that are going to be at the school. And um, thanks for your remarks and um, just really exciting to see. And all I can say, as far as the report goes, um, we are moving forward. And as John said, we're, 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 on schedule and on budget. And as far as being ahead of schedule and under budget, we'll, we'll kind of leave those for uh, future conversations, but the, the project is moving forward and it's just great. And there was a lot of energy there, even though we couldn't have the public and seeing the students sign the beam and it's permanently in the building. I just think that's really cool. One of the things we might do, David Sandin was saying, is to try and do a time capsule like you hear, you know, buildings do a, you know, and you have a little brick where there's um, things that can get put in the corner of the building. So, you know, we're going to continue to do those kinds of things to just try and celebrate the success of the project as we go forward. And that's all I have. Very cool. Thanks, David. It was, it was, oh, sorry. Go ahead, sir. No, go ahead, Meg. Oh, you're good. You're good. Go for it. Uh, it was a really fun morning. I, I was I was really glad that um, you know that we got to participate. Yep. Yeah, it was great, and congratulations and well done. You know, to everyone on the building committee. You know, our the partners and vendors that we work with. I just think it's been a great team effort, and you know, this was just one more milestone towards the finished product. Yep. Really, really exciting. Sean and Don are there and the, and the teachers and um, just the overall excitement of, of what it's going to be like, you know, next year when you know, we cut the ribbon and the students actually go into school. So it, it, it's a nice distraction from some of the COVID-19 that we have going on and some 
so so far so good with with the project and they're they're following all the rigid guidelines related to it and social distancing and so hopefully that can continue and we won't have any um related delays but um yeah just a great day so thanks for everybody thanks david all right, so that moves us to closing business. Um, obviously, I've mentioned a few times we need to pick a date next week, um, but I just wanted to give a short update um, and just kind of talk a little bit about the, the process and getting us to the MOA. Um, so I just want to point out that the negotiations that have gotten us to this point where we will be voting on an MOA next week uh, have been the very definition of uh, bargaining in good faith. Uh, Dr. Bucky has represented the school committee well in every meeting that I have been privy to. And as our superintendent, he's charged with assisting the committee in reaching sound judgments. And in this matter, Dr. Bucky has acted as the communicator of the committee with the union. Uh, we are now at a point where we will soon have the opportunity to discuss this as a public body. I ask us all to remember that we are members of a committee and we carry out committee decisions once they are made. That applies to the current MOA we have in place, as well as just the one that we will hope to pass next week. Our authority as individuals is to represent the committee and the schools in a way that promotes interest and support. When negotiations with the union happen in a climate of mutual trust and understanding, that goal is much more easily met. As I've said all along, as we have faced challenges due to COVID, if we can continue to work together, we will succeed. Um, at this point in time, with a superintendent who we can trust. It is in everyone's best interest for us to be aligned with John since we have charged him with meeting with the union. This doesn't mean that we can't ask questions and have a lively discussion when it is time for us to vote on the MOA and we are tasked with this duty as individual members of the committee. However, we need to remember that none of us should be eroding the process by engaging in any kind of direct dealing with any of the members of the union. This undermines our employees' belief in the union's ability to represent them as they are entitled to by statute and in our ability to maintain our primary responsibility to the children of the district. It also erodes the credibility of Dr. Bucky as the superintendent, and I know that's not what any of us want to do. Direct dealing can be tempting and is a slippery slope in a small community where we know each other. However, it is always a violation of the law we can communicate accurate information to employees, but we may not bypass the union and deal directly with employees. We need to remember to refer complaints to administrative chain of command. And if we follow these general guidelines, we'll be certain to end up with an MOA that is collaborative and provides the best possible opportunities for the young people of our community. So at the end of the meeting on, um, good grief, I don't even remember what day it was. It was the other day. <laughs> Um, I've lost track of most of my days at this point. Um, it sounded like we had come to a, a, a consensus and that the union felt that if we were as a school committee to meet next Wednesday, that they would be ready and, and have their members have voted on it at that point. Um, so I wanted to put that to the committee at this point to see if Wednesday hopefully works um, and then work to find a time on Wednesday that uh, that everyone is available. Not to be a total pain in the butt, but I am away on Wednesday. Oh. I'm actually away Sunday through Wednesday, through Wednesday, traveling on Wednesday. Okay, all right. But that mean, I mean, you guys can meet without me if you need to. I don't want to hold up the MOA at all. John, thoughts on that? Yeah, I think Thursday would be fine. Okay. All right, sounds good. Are so, <laughs> so no worries. Um, so Thursday. Now, last week, Go ahead. Now, last week, John. Ooh, sorry, John. You had said everything was smooth. You didn't have any anything in your. Um, my words are failing me. I'm sorry. <laughs> anything that looked like it was going to present a problem is that kind of still. You feel everybody's pretty much on the same page. Is just dotting eyes, crossing t's. Yes, I have. Uh, Finalized. I think we have finalized with the union. I've sent it off to John Foskett. I would like to schedule a time with each school committee member individually so that I can sit down and go over it with you. Um, I can release that. Uh, I, I think John is getting back to me tomorrow. And so once he has uh, put his thoughts uh, to it, I can share it uh, over the weekend. 
for school committee to uh, look at. And then the individual meetings will serve two purposes. One, certainly to go over the MOA with me and to ask questions, but two, uh, for me to have time with you to do part of my entry uh, process, which uh, reopening has consumed and I haven't had the opportunity to do that. So um, the individual meetings with you would be super helpful if your schedules would permit that. Great, that's a, that's a fantastic plan. So Thursday works for everybody. Evenings are, are definitely better for me. I've ramped up with our doctor's um, situation again. So days are a little tough. Oh, that's um, fine. Um, Cause I, I actually go back, the kids come back to tower next week. So my week is a little bit nuttier as well. Um, in testing out John's desire to have a 6.30 meeting, would we be willing to put this one at 6.30 and give it a whirl? <laughs> John has spoken. I, I will <laughs> 30. <laughs> I'm not committing to this long term. I'm just letting him try it out this one time. <laughs> um, I personally make it to seven by the skin of my teeth, like getting everybody situated. Um, but it's up to everybody. I'll make I'll I'll do whatever I need to do. Megan, Emily. Uh, either one is fine with me. There we go. Wrong button. I can do either. Yeah, six thirty. Sarah, would you be able to give it a try? I'm not totally certain that I can pull off a regular six thirty either, <laughs> just with how my household functions. Um, but it would be, I would be willing to make an attempt. Yeah, I'll. I may be late. I can't guarantee <laughs> anything. But um, we'll I'll give John his one six thirty meeting. His one six thirty, yes. yes. <laughs> I hope that's not a trade off that it'll go four hours then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, <clears throat> well, with only a few things on the agenda, we'll we'll hope that it we can we can wrap it up relatively quickly. And David, this doesn't cross over on a building committee, right? Um, no, we're not we're not on tap next week. Okay, good. Yeah, we're good to go. Yep, good point. All right, so Thursday, I don't even know, I think that's the 10th um, yes. at 6.30. Okay. Got it. All right, thanks for everybody's flexibility. Um, all right, any other new business? I had something the whole meeting I was holding, but I literally, it's... <laughs> It's gone. It. It's gone now. I can't. Well, if you remember it and you want it on a subsequent agenda, just um, you know, let me know and we'll get it on. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So with that, I will adjourn us at nine forty-six. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.